Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Pineapple Podcast, the Cherry Creek Innovation Campus production. I'm one of your hosts, Nate Barrett. And I'm Morgan Dawson, and today we have the absolute honor of getting to sit down with Rich Snyder, the tortilla savant himself for Rockalitas Tortillas, who's a chairman on the Colorado Restaurant Association and a CFO for the Modern Eater Podcast. Okay, Rich, if you don't mind telling us about everything that you're involved in. Well, you know, I, I got to say, I, because I truly do love our industry, and I have learned the value of networking and being involved and trying to help organizations become better because of your participation. I've been invited uh, to uh, be involved in a lot of organizations. I'm going to read the list because sometimes I can't even remember them all. Uh, obviously, Cherry Creek Innovation Campus, I'm involved there in the advisory board. Uh, Colorado Biz Magazine, I kind of help them find different companies and stuff to feature. and they. They had us as their 2019, 2019 winner of the Food and Beverage of the Year Award. I'm on the board of the Colorado Hotel Lodging Association. Uh, Colorado Proud, we're involved with them. Colorado Restaurant Association, uh, I'm on several different committees there and on the executive committee. Colorado Restaurant Foundation, I'm currently vice chairman on that. Uh, Metro Denver Lodging Council, I'm an allied member and I help uh, set up different meetings and things that they're doing there. A Pueblo Community College down in Pueblo. I'm on their advisory board. Modern Eater, like you said, uh, I am an, an, a part owner and a function day to day as a CFO function and a past board member of We Don't Waste, a food recovery organization. So those things keep me in front of a whole lot of people a whole lot of hours every day. And so what do you find is the benefit of having you in front of all those people? Oh, you know what? There's so many, uh, many of them personal, many of them professional. Um, my ability, the, the funnest part to me is being able to find people that are up and coming with either a spice company or a meat purveyor or, or somebody who's uh, taking a baking and they want to take it from that cottage business to, okay, I need to go rent the kitchen. Being able to help them on the, the different facets of that growth, what that looks like and advise them and guide them, that's really the funnest thing. All the, the different connections of people that I've made from equipment to end user to potential where the, where the products would be sold and distributed. And so that is a lot of networking that you have to do. When you were first starting out your business, was that something you struggled with? I know your personality, you're very talkative, but was that something you were kind of nervous about in the beginning? Well, I wouldn't say nervous, but we were not, you know, uh, I'll, I'll kind of back up a little bit. Rockalitas Tortillas, we trace our roots back. It's been in our family since 1960. And really until the late 80s, did people outside of Mexican restaurants want to talk to us. So, for example, for me to approach the Colorado Restaurant Association and go talk to these different people, uh, or even distributors for that matter. They were like, tortillas are a small, small segment of the market. We have, there, there's really nothing here for you. So we didn't even have the opportunity to ne necessarily uh, open, you know, write the check, get in and get involved. We were, our, our industry was too small of a piece of a pot. And so now though, as it has grown and emerged and now almost everyone uses tortillas, and, and at all kinds of different places, not just restaurants, but hotels, resorts, airports, convenience stores, all these different places. Now that it, we're, we're much more welcome, let's put it that way. We have way more opportunities to network and join these organizations than we did before. And it, that's so satisfying to me, you cannot imagine. And so when a company asks you what sets you apart from other tortillas? What do you say? Boy, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, when we first would go out and try to sell, basically they were like, okay, your tortillas are round and flat like everyone else's. Why should I buy yours? And to be honest, I didn't even have a good answer. I had, I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so we had to start making our story, hunting down certain ingredients, using different processes. Um, making sure they're local, knowing the farmers, having wind generated electricity. We had to build a story. And we were really lucky in that that story played very well in Denver. 
Mm-hmm. I always say, you know, I don't know we would have done so well in Toledo. They might not have cared. But here in Colorado, uh, anybody that's coming up in the business, we are really where all the uh, so many national food trends start right here. So anyone who attacks uh, developing their story right here, they have incredible opportunities right out of the sheet. Yeah. Well, that's what we had to do is build that story from the grain, from the flour or the corn to the oil, to the ingredients, to the power that we use. We built that this whole story. It's taken, you know, 30 years to build this story. Yeah. Um, so you're definitely a big part of our class. You're on the board of advisors for our class. And how did that happen? I actually don't know the story. Were you networking and it just happened to come up or what happened? Well, Audra and I uh, got uh, involved. Our paths crossed in uh, ProStart. Yes. And when I found out about ProStart, and I'll tell you, I only found out about ProStart maybe six years ago. But when I did, it completely blew me away. It made me so happy for the future of our industry to see high school kids getting so involved in the management preparation of food and the food safety and all the different things that they were doing. It, 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 I was like, I have to get involved in this. It, it both because I felt a moral obligation because this industry has been great to me, but I'm like, I have some information. I have some things that I can give to these students to help them. And so uh, we got involved with ProStart when she was at Grandview. My youngest daughter, Raven, went to Grandview. She was in ProStart. And that's how, uh, then I found out what a true stud Audra is. She was like the uh, all-star pro start teacher. And then uh, that year that Raven was in, what was it, Audra, three, three years ago? Um, three years ago. They, they, took, they won state, and then they placed fifth in the country for management. Nice. So when, when, the CC, when the CCIC was open, Audra reached out, would you like to be on this advisory board? And well, I had to think about all of a nanosecond. To answer that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we're really lucky to go to a school with so many, I mean, every class, obviously, but we have so many people in our class alone or in the hospitality program. Um, we just have so many people who are coming into our school and helping us grow our career and giving us advice. So we're really grateful that you're here talking to us today. It's nice knowing no one is throwing tortillas at me. True story. One of the first times my brother and I went out to try to sell tortillas, we had the tortillas thrown back at us. What? Yes, we were like, because we were trying to expand tortillas outside of Mexican restaurants. We knew that was the only way to grow. And so we went to a little diner on East Colfax, just east of the Capitol. The, uh, the chef, you know, I asked him, would you be interested in buying our tortillas? Heck, we'll show you how to make breakfast burritos. Breakfast burritos were not in every store, much less fast food and all this stuff. And uh, he basically looked at the tortillas, looked at us, and he's like, you see a donkey on the front of this place? I don't need this garbage, and that's not the word that he used. And he threw them at us. And in the dining room, everyone was laughing at us and jeering at us. And it was like, whoa, this is going to be hard. Oh, no. So what did you think break then? I'm sorry? What, what did you, what do you think was your big break? Like, when was the moment you were like, okay, this might work out? <laughs> I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the first moment, um, I would say here i mean we've had we've been blessed with so many people that have helped us it has not been all because of what we have done we've been blessed by uh, a lot of people i'm going to say the first really cool moment was when we got on the food network uh they came and did an episode on corn and how to make chips <clears throat> and get a load of this actually they approached one of our competitors here in denver said we want to do a episode on how to make chips Actually, they wanted to do it on Chipotle's chips because their corn tortillas for chips were made here in Denver. And our friendly competitor, and I'll tell you who it is, Ready Foods, is a great organization. Uh, We've been competitors, but more than that, we've been friends uh, for a long, long time. 
And so Marco over there at Ready Foods told the people for Food Network, don't show our story. We're, make, we're using masa flour at the time. They were. Go over to Rockalita, see how they're doing it. They're doing it the way it should be made. And so that's how we got on the Food Network. And so that was the first of many different things uh, on media and, and TV. But that was one where it was like, whoa, that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And I loved how you said competitors, but also friends, because it's not always going to be cutthroat. You can have civil interactions with other companies. I love the way you said that. That's really, you know, it's, it's funny. We've been doing this a long time and, and not just here in Denver, but nationally, we're very well known for, we've got a good reputation for, for being above all else, just decent guys. Yeah. And so I have, uh, for example, last week I had a food broker back on the East Coast, Virginia, the Carolinas, back in there, and he needed a whole bunch of tortillas, way more than I could possibly make. I do not want to make all the tortillas in the world. I, I learned that the hard way. So I refer him to a friend of mine in Chicago that's got multiple plants all over the United States. I'm like, here's the guy that can take care of it. And, and so I do a lot of matchmaking that way. Yeah. We do that nationally. And even locally, I've referred company, uh, uh, a restaurant just last week to La Tolteca, another tortilla manufacturer here in Colorado, they're in Pueblo, and another one called uh, Colorado Tortilla over in Commerce City. I referred some business over to them. We And, and part of all this is, is you got to learn what you're good at and stay in your lane. And we stay in our lane. So if someone calls me and they're like, I need this type of product, I'm like, I'm not your guy. I'm not going to go in that lane but I know the perfect person for you. And I turn them over to them. That's awesome. That's great. What, what drives your passion for tortillas then? Why tortillas? Because I'll, I'll tell you real quick, I don't want tortillas thrown at me anymore. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's what it is. And I, and I also want actually uh, our food to be looked at in a different way and i'm not disparaging uh many of the fast food outlets that are that are putting out a lot of uh, cheap mexican food but if you travel to mexico and you go look at the at the chefs you talk to the chefs and you see what they're doing mexican food truly mexican food is some of the most precise intricate food in the world and it saddens me when i see cheap stuff thrown out and that's for representative of mexican food and so uh, overall, I'm trying my uh, our, our thing here is let's elevate what people what they think of when they think of Mexican food. So I couldn't that's agree more. It's like uh, if you just mess up the masa in a tamale, the tamale is no good, right? Absolutely. Or the mole. Mole is really hard. I've, I've tried to make that mole is very hard. Well, and with mole specifically. That's probably the mother of all sauces. Yes. And it, there, and there are no rules. There's no limits or minimums on ingredients. Uh -huh. So uh, mole can be many, can go many, many directions. Yeah. And that's a, that's an awesome, awesome dish. I love a great mole. Every time we talk to somebody who's more in the culinary industry, I mean, you you've got a foot in both hospitality and culinary. They kind of lap over, but he'll start talking about how good of a cook he is. And I struggle to make a good pancake. So I'm a little bit lost right now. <laughs> I mean, I was the same way like last year. It's just because yeah. of COVID, I, I've been cooking a lot more. Like mm -hmm. it was mainly uh, steaks. Steaks what got me into it. Yeah. Like, when I cook a nice, I never had a better steak until I cooked this tenderloin perfectly like rare at like 145 i let it rest for like 10 minutes and it was beautiful and then i was like okay i think i want to <laughs> do more of this oh that's awesome now and i'm going to tell you uh, when it comes to cooking i cannot cook to save my soul <laughs> <laughs> well morgan, we're on the same page uh, morgan i'm way more on your end of this than nate's okay. let me tell you um and what's funny is i'll go and, and explain to people okay here's what you do this and saute and, and I can explain it, but I can't, I can't do it. I can't yeah, do it. It's definitely an art. It really, really is. Like when they say like, 
it's an art. I used to think like you're just beating something up, but no, it's it's an art and like I love how timing comes into it. Like it's all about the timing and if it's off then the whole thing's gonna be off. Oh, it's very much an art, but I mean there's so much more than in a painting. And that a painting, okay, so you've got a canvas, and many times that's exactly how I talk about our product, is that we are the canvas for yeah. the culinary artist to paint on. But and so I'm like, okay, so if you've marinated your your pork for 48 hours and then you've grilled and you've done all this other stuff, and the 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 taco falls apart because you used a cheap tortilla. Have you done justice to your product? And I'm like, we're trying to make a product here that is respective of your time, of your effort, of your experience, of your learning, that we, we've we earned the right to be on the plate with you. And so that's 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 how we sell. Well, 100%, I would totally agree. The tortilla is perfect, you know, you can, uh, cut it up, crisp it up into chips, or you can, you know, there's so many different uses for a tortilla. And like you said, it's exactly like a blank canvas. You can throw anything on there, carne asada, lengua, or just some regular beef, you know, just have some tacos or anything. Sometimes, you know, I'll just cut one up and I'll crisp it up just to have add a little bit of texture to my dish. Just because, you know, because it's, it's got that uh, universal flavor, you could say. Yeah, well, we're making one, for example, if you really want to go out on the artist, artisanal side, we're making a hibiscus corn turkey. We went down to uh, Guadalajara, tried Jamaica all over Guadalajara to get the different oh. uses. The hibiscus leaves, the, the cinnamon, the vanilla, the clove, all the different things. And we came back and we made an outrageous hibiscus corn tortilla. Wow. All the chefs that are making like uh, lobster tacos on them. Uh -huh. Also let them dry, put them in a food processor, grind them down to a powder, uh -huh. and grind it like shrimp. And when you fry that, it's this deep purple that is incredible. Wow. Another thing we're trying with pretty soon is grinding them up uh, a little coarser and using them in the way of like graham crackers. Okay. Make a crust for the pie. So you'd sweeten the, the yeah. tea with, with, with all the stuff and make a key lime pie but with a purple crust on it. Yeah, so, that's uh, awesome. That's, that's very interesting. We're, we're not for everybody. You know, probably 80% yeah. of the people look and they're like, they don't get what it is that we're doing. <laughs> but those other, that other 20%, yeah. they're like, you know, thank God somebody is, is this insane about these products. <laughs> yeah. And it's so inspiring because I didn't even think that there was, sorry, my voice. Um, you don't think about how many different tortilla companies there are because i mean it's not something you consciously think about no. but the way you explain it and your passion for it it shows that there are so many different opportunities within the hospitality industry and the culinary industry for specific career fields and oh, yeah. that's awesome you know we talk about that on the modern eater a lot uh, and here here too that the industry is so funny when people from the outside see it, they truly see just the tip of this huge iceberg. Yeah. Is that they're, they're, they think career choices are, okay, I can either be a server, I can be a chef or a bartender or a restaurant owner. There's just a handful of things. But yeah. if people knew, and that's why we started the show, The Modern Year, to show the stories from the hot plate the, you know where the, where you put the the plate up where the chef puts the food for the front of the house to come get it yeah from that from the hot plate to the farm yeah. how many people are involved farmers ranchers brewers distillers food distributors drivers the sales people you have interior decorators you have software developers you have i mean food writers there there is there is so many more than that and so sometimes people will get, well, I didn't really like those, but it's like, but there's a whole lot more for you to try. And so I think our, our and that's one of the reasons why I got involved in the modern eater is truly, I wanted for our industry, for people that are maybe interested in getting in our industry, I wanted them to know how much there is back there. A person could be a fantastic accountant. In fact, we're, we're teaming up with an accounting firm to teach people in our industry the importance of good bookkeeping, uh, good budgeting, personal and business. What should your food cost be? 
Where can you save money? What you, should you spend on marketing? All these, there's so many things, so many things. It's not even fun. Um, and I actually just applied, or I registered for college. I'm going to University of Nevada, Reno. And I chose oh, that wow. instead of Las Vegas. Um, even though Las Vegas, because it has the hospitality college within the university, um, I actually ended up going with UNR because I could see myself there for the next four years more than I could at UNLV. But there's so many more things that my mom was worried about that I wasn't going in specifically for hospitality. They've got marketing, they've got management, they've got all the businesses. And I was like, mom, all of this stuff, I could take all these courses and I would still transfer over into a hospitality career. This is everything I've already started learning at CCIC. So I love how even though you're not going in, I'm not going in specifically for hospitality, I could take all these courses and come out a stronger person to build a career. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I tell you, I think I commend you on your choice of Reno. <laughs> uh, that's one of my, and it's funny because a lot of people will, and, and I bet you're getting the same reaction. When I say, you know, if I had to move somewhere, it would be Reno. It's such uh, I, I can see, to me, when I see Reno specifically, we won't dive down this rabbit hole. Here, but Reno is like Denver maybe 25 years ago. I could totally see where, not just geographically where it's going to grow, but culinarily and all these things. And you've got Lake Tahoe right in your backyard. And uh, good choice. Good for you. Good for you. I have a great chef friend. His name is Chef Joe Edom, one of the top awarded chefs in the United States, period. He lives in Reno. Awesome. Look him up when you get there. Okay, I'll do. I've got so many people just from this podcast. Everybody at the end of the podcast or at one point in the podcast is like, I've got somebody for you to contact. So I feel like after this podcast, we're really set. It, it's kind of scary having so many people be like, oh, I've got your back. You want a job after college? We got you. Yeah. Yeah. Grateful Gardens, another great uh, breakfast chain that started up in Reno. He is, Gino is his name. He is killing it over there. Okay. What, what opportunities do you see that high schoolers or those listening can take right now to improve their networking? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. To improve your networking at a high school level. I would say what most people need to do is, and it's funny, I had this conversation in my office just last week, get over your fear or inexperience of public speaking. If you're in high school right now and you can take a drama class or a debate class or something for public speaking, it is huge because, uh, for example, here. Uh, or the chef that came in, she's like, she was like, I'm going to culinary school. I want to be a private chef. And I said, you need to take, take public speaking classes. And she looked at me really puzzled, like, why would I want to do that? <clears throat> and I said, okay, well, let's unpack this. I said, if you're the, let's say the one of the best home personal chefs and people have hired you to do a, uh, a private dinner for 10 let's say 12, 20 of their closest and best friends. Really what everyone's looking for is a uh, food network experience. And if you as a chef can, okay, you, you've put out, you've, you've played the first course, it's on the table. You go out now and explain to them what they're eating, what farms it came from, how you prepared it, and, and, and give them that compelling backstory you have enhanced the experience of that dinner so much. And if you do that course after course, you've just in, increased the value of your being a home chef. Uh, and you know where I learned this? In architecture. Get a lot of this. Frank Lloyd Wright has a Taliesin West. Uh, it was a school for architects. And I visited that. I go there for inspiration. And he built an auditorium. And they were telling us, uh, that they gave public speaking classes to the to the uh, architects, and um, why would they do that? And and his thing was, you can draw the most compelling, beautiful building, but if you can't sell it, it only makes it to the paper. You have to you have to draw it, design it, 
and somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody's got to, you got to sell it to somebody. Yeah. So I think in, in our careers, absolutely learning how to speak uh, in public in a compelling way and knowing your timing and stuff is paramount. That is huge. You know where, where I learned public speaking? Where? I did stand up comedy at the Comedy Works for about eight years in the Did you stand up? Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And I learned there in public speaking. The first rule is you have about four, maybe five seconds to grab their attention and get them to like you. Oh, that's great. The comedy works is awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. the best place in Colorado. Besides, <laughs> in my opinion, the one in Boulder is pretty nice, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very much, uh, I'm, I'm very loyal to the comedy works here in Denver. Yeah. You know, but uh, boy, you talk about uh, learning and, and getting slapped around. That's <laughs> definitely around. Yeah, because if you bomb it, they say it's the worst feeling in the world. And I and I tasted that feeling many, yeah. many times, let me tell you. <laughs> but you do, you, you've got to come out with something, you got about four or five seconds, and uh, you've got to be endearing. You know, my 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 personal thing is I, I tend to be self-deprecating. You know, uh, just just I, I try to come across as like a humble guy that's somebody that's still learning. Yes, I've done a lot of stuff, but I'm still learning. And more importantly, I still want to help more. I have not reached my peak on helping people. Yeah. And so with with comedy, you know, you have to present yourself in a certain way. That obviously links back to Rockalita's tortillas or you know the modern eater yeah. and do you have any stories about where you just maybe said something wrong or like whether it was comedy or interacting with a business partner do you have any like do's and don'ts for us oh my god there there's how, how much time do we have <laughs> there's a lot but you know a lot of it really is uh don't be so afraid of the mistakes that you're not yourself. You know, you're going to make those mistakes. Like you're going to fail in a long-term career. You're going to have failure. If you're scared to like, like here, I've always said, um, I'm not afraid of failing, but I'm scared to death of not succeeding. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, go out to do that. Uh, be endearing to people. I, one of the things, uh, um, you know, I like to be prepared. I like to, for for example, on the modern eater, when we have guests on, um, I like to learn a lot about them, and not the, and and I'm trying to pull the pertinent facts, the, the facts that maybe people don't necessarily know about them. I gently pull that, and there are times where they'll forget to bring that up, and that's the part that I love to. Oh, wait a minute didn't you, you know, this and that, and oh, yeah, and I, I love that. I, that's what I like to do is, is on the show, pull a fact about that person, pull a new fact out that maybe nobody knew, yeah. and you learn another facet of that person. You grow to appreciate them more. And I took a look at your Instagram for The Modern Eater, and if I can remember, did you have Ben from The Bachelor on there? Uh, yeah, I think uh, last week or the week before. Yeah, I saw that and I remember. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to mention that. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> uh, I thought that was so cool. <laughs> oh, we've had uh, we've had some pretty amazing people on there, and we just uh, we we were approached uh, yesterday by someone. We're at the point now where we're being approached. Uh, yeah. and we had somebody very well known just about uh, us getting involved with them. Uh, and that's kind of fun when you come around on that side. So like when you asked about where those big, when do you feel like you made it yesterday, having a person of that caliber come and talk to us and them telling us, you know what we can see in the, in the food service category, you guys are where it's at. And, and we want to tie our brand that's very, very well known to you. And so that's when you kind of go, yeah, that, that we were real happy about that. So what was your biggest challenge with The Modern Eater? What did you find? Because obviously we're a new podcast and people listening, they might want to get involved in something like that. So, Yeah, and we see more of it. And, you know, we've always tried, uh, personally, I've always tried to be more of an innovator than an imitator. Mm -hmm. 
And certainly on that, you know, there's been a lot of over the years, uh, some great radio shows promoting food. Uh, Pat Miller, Gabby Gourmet, I love her. Uh, we've got Warren Byrne, we've got some others that are doing that. But it's been a radio show and it's been trying to describe the food um, verbally. No one can see anything. And it was always focused on, the, on from the hot window to the front door. It was about the dining room, the ambiance, the lighting and all that stuff. So we wanted to do something different. And so the challenges were trying to get, uh, as we were, you know, we're a sponsor model. We hire, uh, or I should say, we're hired by different food companies to promote their brands during the show. Yeah. And so trying to get them to share our vision when you're an innovator and the further out there your vision is and others can't quite see that yet, there, there's, there's a problem. It, it takes a lot of convincing. And yeah. so with that, a couple people saw it right out of the gate, those that had that vision. But the reality was not enough to make the business self-sustaining. Yeah. And so then you start wondering, am I doing this wrong? You know, and it's like, no, we were right. Just not enough people had seen it yet. Okay. So that was that sometimes, and we run into that here. Um, and so when it comes to presenting yourself in a certain way, do you have any tips for high schoolers to put their best foot forward when it comes to basically any career field? I know we obviously love hospitality, but when they're getting started, in trying to build their career. Do you have any advice for that? Big time. Uh, don't chase the bucks. Do not chase the money. Chase the experience. And by the experience, I mean, okay, so if you can go to work for, for example, let's say hospitality. If you can go to work for Frank Bonanno in any of his concepts, and you're making this much an hour, and you go somewhere else that they really don't have systems in place. They really are not aware of it. Even if they're mildly successful, they still don't even know why, but they're gonna pay you this much. Trust me, over the long haul, Frank Bonanno, the lower wage job, but yet with the better experience, learning better systems, learning the industry better, will put you way ahead. So chase the experience that you're gonna get at that place, not the dollars, and that's, been probably the biggest part of our industry. The problem that we had before COVID hit is there were so many restaurants open and the talent pool was not nearly big enough to support. And so the only way restaurants were getting people in was to, or, or getting their staff is to, okay, I'll give them another 50 cents an hour, 75 cents a buck an hour. And so you had migrations of back of the house in front of the house going around. And they were chasing that dollar, but they should have been chasing that experience because learning how to how to operate the right systems in the right manner and how to learn how to how to correct how to correctly treat your guests, those people that learn those lessons now they're they're poised for for a massive success. But chase the experience, not the dollars when you're young. And I'll tell you what else happens too is when you get the experience. And you get it so well, you learn your craft so well that even others recognize it. That's when the money chases you. Yeah. All right. Um, and so for all of our interviewees and our guests, um, for our future leaders listening right now, is there any advice about anything that you'd like to give them? Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. I would say uh, in these different trade organizations, join, jump in the pool. It's not important. Uh, where just get in the pool. So now you're in the organization, you've gone to the first meeting, it's, it's filled with rooms of potential, either uh, new jobs or, or new customers. The worst thing you can do is just run up and start giving people cards and what can I sell you? What can I sell you? What can I sell you? Take the long-term approach. And I always say, be more anxious to serve than desperate to sell. Yeah. And there's a lot there. Be more, more anxious to serve than desperate to sell. And then go in there. And I still do this to this day. What can I do for you? Is there a phone call? Is there a connection? Is there something I can help you with, an idea or something? Here's my card. If there's something I can do, let me know. Yeah. Keep coming at it that way. Um, the worst, I'll tell you, the worst example I ever saw 
and, and this was with the Colorado Hotel Lodging Association. And the hotels were giving us reports of what was coming up on the industry. And it was not a good time in the industry. And this one gentleman who sold them all, uh, I, I don't want to say the service because I don't want to give away his identity. But he stood up in the middle of all these people and said, you know, I really don't care about all this uh, industry information. I came here to sell people stuff, my, my services. I, I really don't want to hear this. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, you just watch yourself yeah. out of everyone's mind. So yeah. again, I'm going to say, be that. Be more anxious to serve than desperate to sell. Go in, uh, introduce yourself, but ask them how they can help them. You know, anyone in this industry, our best thing is when we're, we're of service of others. And many times we're always taking care of people. When someone does make an effort to come take care of us, you stand out big time. So that's the way to start. Thank you everyone for watching this episode of the Pineapple Podcast with Rich Snyder. And if you wanted to keep up with Rock Leaders Tortillas, go to Rock Tortillas on Instagram and Facebook. And then if you wanted to keep up with The Modern Eater, you could go to themoderneater.com or The Modern Eater on instagram to keep up to date with everything the pineapple podcast has going on go to pineapple podcast ccic on tiktok facebook instagram and youtube thank you guys